Hello, welcome to the mental health and CBD panel at the 20, 2021 AHA scientific sessions. My name is Dr. Aziz Asatius, Associate Professor um, and today's moderator. I'm the Director of the Media and Innovation Lab and Associate Director for the Center for Translational Sleep and Circadian Sciences at the University of the Miami Miller School of Medicine. And I am delighted to be today's moderator. Today we have a great and a rare opportunity to discuss mental health and CVD through a multidisciplinary and multi-sector lens. Mental health and well-being is a critical component of overall health and impacts physical health in a variety of ways. For today's panel, we're looking at mental health as an omni phenomenon, where it can act as a risk factor, a correlate, a moderator, a consequence, or an artifact, which we'll describe at length in today's panel. Then we will describe a variety of solutions and opportunities to address this coexistence of mental health and heart disease. But before we launch in, let's actually have some ground rules and understandings and definitions. So what is mental health? Well, mental health is simply this. Um, and, and we're gonna talk more about mental health and well-being. And it really refers to a person's emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Mental health and well-being involves how we think, how we feel, how we act and make choices. And how do we operate? How do this operate? How does mental health operate with heart disease and heart health? Well, mental health disorders and well-being can work both short-term, medium-term, and long-term, and can interfere with a person's mood behavior, thinking, and ability to relate to others. Several studies show the impact of mental health from trauma and depression, which my esteemed and illustrious panelists will discuss soon. Before they discuss it, I would like them to introduce themselves because today we have a treat, a treat of a panel of several practitioners, researchers, innovators, and visionaries. So I'll have them introduce themselves first. Eliane, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Azizi. So my name is Eliane Boucher. I am the Director of Research Strategy at Happify Health. And we're essentially a clinical grade technology company that really aims to shorten the distance between near need and care by configuring personalized digital therapeutics and care solutions that improve mental health, physical health, and wellness. So where I'm really privileged to be here and be part of this conversation. Thank you so much for having me here as well. My name is Jared Mignani. I'm an associate professor of medicine here at the University of Pittsburgh with tenure. And my program develops interventions using mobile health and other strategies that are tailored for individuals with limited health literacy and other social disadvantages. The goal of the program is to improve cardiovascular disease outcomes and to improve chronic disease self-management in individuals who are at social disadvantage. Thank you. And my name is Rob Montgomery. Uh, I am a research associate at Happify Health uh, with Dr. Boucher. And uh, I lead a program of research on our digital therapeutics um, under the supervise, uh, as under the supervisement, I should say, of uh, Dr. Boucher. Um, and this includes the Happify Heart and Mind product, uh, which was co-designed with the AHA, which we'll be discussing a little bit later today. I'm also very honored and humbled to be here with everyone. Hi, my name is Britton Taylor. I'm a neuroengineer at Indiana University Bloomington, and our research focuses on early detection, early intervention opportunities using remote physiological measurements to help people understand how their autonomic nervous system is impacted in real time. I'm also the CEO and founder of ShuffleMe, which is an artificial intelligence predictive software that helps youth and young adults understand which social media content impacts their mood in real time. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you. So again, folks, for our audience, welcome again. And as I shared with you earlier, and I was not being hyperbolic that we have, I think, one of the best panels to discuss this topic. And so I'll start out with an initial question and I'll pose it to Elian first. Elian, um, obviously you have a tremendous amount of background in this space. 
Um, but I know something that yourself, your own career, as well as Happify have dedicated to is trying to understand mental health as a predictor. Can you share a little bit more about that, um, please, with, um, with the audience? Yeah, absolutely. I think oftentimes when we think about mental health and physical health, we think about um, poor physical health having an impact on our mental health. But sometimes we forget that mental health, poor mental health can actually um, increase our risk for physical conditions as well. So there's research showing that your mental health status, and that includes things like severe mental illness, like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, or less severe conditions like depression or even languishing, something that's become more of a hot topic during um, the pandemic, which is really the absence of mental health, right? Flourish is good mental health. Languishing is the opposite of that. And all of those are associated with a higher risk for cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events. That doesn't mean co-occurring, right? That means before anyone has this cardiovascular event, the presence of this poor mental health heightens the risk of having it later on. The interesting thing is um, we don't really know why that happens. We know it does happen, but we don't know why is poor mental health acting as a greater risk factor. It's possible that the poor mental health is increasing some behaviors that also pose a risk, things like smoking or poor eating, obesity, right? So um, it may be a precursor to some other mediator. Um, it may also be related to certain me medications that are actually used to treat the mental illness. So it may not be a direct result of the mental illness itself. But the other really interesting thing is that there's lots of researchers who think it's because of chronic stress, that chronic stress really plays a role. And there's evidence that other things like maternal depression, adverse childhood events, so social isolation, loneliness, work stress, all kinds of stress heighten your risk for cardiovascular disease as well. And presumably that might be because it activates our sympathetic nervous system. It places greater strain on our cardiovascular system by raising our blood pressure, raising our heart rate, generally increasing the amount of cardiac work our body has to do. So the more we experience that stress, the more of a strain it places on our body. So that's kind of an interesting aspect that mental health may play kind of a direct role in having an impact on our bodies that predisposes us for cardio, cardiac events. Oh, yeah, that, that's really comprehensive and, and thank you so much for really, I think, covering, you know, a, a wide range um, of literature on this topic. Um, I'll just kind of, you know, pinpoint one of the topics and one of the areas that you just discussed and I'll bring in my good friend, Jerry, um, who's a clinician where you have developed um, you know, lifestyle-based types of interventions, and you see the direct impact of mental health in your clinic. Can you expand a little in terms of, you know, especially for clinicians or practitioners on today's um, um, uh, um, conference, please? Sure, thank you, Azizi. I think that Elian gave, a, as you said, a very comprehensive overview. I think that one thing that is a challenge as a practitioner is that there isn't a single smoking gun that allows us to identify how mental health is a moderator and a contributor to adverse cardiovascular outcomes, because it is extremely multifactorial and very, very heterogeneous. One thing that I think I have to be cognizant of in terms of assessing mental health in patients is that what I'm seeing is a longitudinal exposure across a life course. Mental health challenges are longstanding and they're complex. They may have been identified, they may be treated or untreated. They can result from and magnify adverse social risk factors too, and social situations. They may stem from adverse childhood experiences. And so they may have a, a vast subclinical contribution towards individuals' self-perception and their experience and their interaction with the world. So this is obviously really, really complicated. Um, when we think about mental health and the resulting adverse functional and cognitive limitations, these may be behavioral, it's really key to consider that measuring it in an adult, it might just be the tip of the iceberg. And I think as a clinician, um, which is a quarter of the time I'm seeing patients in the office or in the hospital, it's really fair to state that we clinicians in general, I think I can say this as a cardiologist, we're undertrained or we have very limited training in the assessment of mental health disorders and their contribution towards our patients' well-being. 
And so uh, for a lot of us, this is really kind of a black box. Um, we don't have the vocabulary. Um, we don't have the skill set to engage with our patients about this very important domain that will impact their cardiovascular risk as well as their chronic disease self-management. And we may not appreciate the longitudinal contribution towards adverse self-care as well as the impact mental health may have on social and economic status, educational attainment, vocational status, um, people's ability to maintain their own welfare. Um, we know very little, I think, about mental health and the intersection with health literacy as well, and how that may further exacerbate control of cardiovascular risk factors. Thank you. I oh, know that's fantastic, Jared. And I'll just ask one more question. I see Rob, you know, um, you know, just one, you know, quick question because I, I, you know, I'd love to ask Rob something soon, but I'll come back to Eliane um, just to close the loop um, because Jared mentioned a lot about assessing mental health um, for the clinicians, practitioners there. Um, are there some, and, and I, please forgive me for saying this, but really simple, easy types of you know, measurements that folks can assess their patients or um, around mental health. And, and I see in the chat someone talking about the SCAD and all these more highly technical types of assessment tools, but are there tools that people can utilize? And it could be well-established or it could be even ecologically momentary assessment types of right. assessments. We could just share briefly, please. That's a great question, Azizi. And I, I think to Jared's point, just recognizing that a lot of physicians and clinicians are not trained in mental health. Um, and it's, it's a problem because what we do know from the research is people who present to physicians with chronic physical conditions, their mental conditions often go unnoticed because it's just assumed that, oh, this is a product of how you're feeling physically. And so that gets ignored. So I have really been a proponent of widespread depression, anxiety screening. And I, I think this is starting to happen. At least my um, PCP does this for me when I come in. I actually laugh because I recognize the assessments. The PHQ-2, the GAD-2, these are two item screening tools to measure depression and measure anxiety. And they can trigger to say this person meets a cutoff. They need to kind of go further. So I laugh because I can tell when I'm answering in a way that tells my physician or the nurse who's administering it, oh, whoa, she got a score of three or above. I've got to now administer the full seven or nine item assessment. So really kind of making that a part of every routine visit, whether it's a primary care physician or a cardiologist or a nurse, whoever it is, takes the decision-making out of the practitioner's hands of saying, is there a mental health problem going on here and just makes it a routine part of the visit of kind of saying, oh, this person is screening high here. I either need to refer them out to someone or we need to talk about this as part of it. I love that. And, and I think that's really excellent. And I kind of pinpoint um, solutions and not necessarily solutions, but assessment tools that we can use. Uh, and I think that really raises the issue um, that other clinicians or practitioners may have, which is this, okay, all right, you've just established that, um, you know, mental health and stress and psychological factors and emotional well-being can serve as predictors or drivers of heart health. But what if my patient already um, has that heart, you know, health condition or poor heart health, and I'm finding that they may be having difficulties with coping um, or it may serve as a moderator to their care. Uh, Rob, I know you've done some work in this space. Do you mind sharing a little bit, please, about um, how is it that you know, mental health well-being you know, serve as a bit of a moderator, um, modifying um, heart health, please? Yes, gladly, Susie, thank you. Um, so you teed it up really nicely. I think many of us are familiar here that the first line treatment uh, for those who are struggling with their cardiovascular health would be lifestyle behavior change, encouraging healthy diets, increased exercise, uh, improved medication adherence, and mental health can directly interfere uh, with all of these self-management behaviors that we would usually prescribe and encourage in our 
patients who are struggling with their cardiovascular health. Um, and I think it goes even further than that. Uh, these are the patients who are already fortunate enough to be receiving some kind of care or encouragement. There's already a huge bucket of people that are just missed in the first place because they're not funneling into the, the healthcare system in a way that they need to um, for various reasons of uh, lack of privilege and different disparities in our system as it currently stands. Um, so even for the lucky ones who managed to get in and managed to get some kind of support and treatment, uh, for their cardiovascular health, many of uh, these folks estimated between 20 and 30% and just those who have sort of general cardiovascular health risk factors. And it's even higher if you're post acute, if you've just had a myocardial infarction, 50% or higher is the estimate, I believe, for those who suffer from mental health issues. Naturally, it's sort of to be expected after such a traumatic event. Um, but those issues, stand in the way of developing the very behaviors that you would need to recover and ultimately to improve your cardiovascular health. I think that's fantastic. And I'll just kind of bring in Britain as well, because I know Britain, I think you are the, I guess, you know, no disrespect to anyone, but you're the resident unicorn on this, um, where you have such an eclectic background. Um, share a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, what your understanding is in terms of how is it that you're seeing, even in your solution that you've developed, um, how you know, mental health, psychological well-being has impacted adherence or just let general engagement with treatment? Yeah, so with our solution, what we really tried to do is incorporate different kinds of biometrics. So we have facial motion recognition, non-contact heart rate, speech and motion recognition, typing behavior. And what we do realize is it really depends on what people are seeing on, for example, social media, which is what our solution does. When they see something, that heart rate could drop, that heart rate could increase. Um, we're also looking at different facial expressions. So it's really important where we try to understand, you know, when they see that content, then what do we do, right? We're, we're seeing how their physiological measurements are responding. Um, their autonomic nervous system is, is responding to that content. But what I am seeing is that, for example, when politics, you know, when you're trying to have the president voting and there's different information being pushed out, what they call misinformation, that then, that then causes, um, you know, people's heart rate to change um, and also how they're responding to that content. When there's anything politically related to racism, that also changes uh, people's response. So it really just depends on what people are seeing in that moment and then how their bodies are responding. And now they don't know what to do. Now they're, they're flustered. Um, so that's really what we've been seeing thus far. And that's kind of why we have that solution to really help people understand, okay, you just saw this. And because you saw this, now that's why you're responding this way versus, you know, you experience something and then you go see your therapist a couple of weeks later and now you're filling out a health assessment. And you're trying to remember, what did I see again? What, what happened again? And now you have these subjective responses. I think that's one of the things that fascinates me about your program, Brittany, is the fact that, you know, I think previously when, you know, I think, or traditionally, when we talk or mention, you know, mental health or emotional well-being, we think of a kind of a mental or a cognitive process or something to measure. And, and I think what you have established, and I know others uh, have well, as well rather, is to really look at physiological reactions because though they themselves might be more telling, especially when um, you're, you know, looking at um, populations that are diverse, where people may um, manifest and show um, mental health differently. Um, I, I don't know, Elian, if you wanted to comment on that in terms of how are you seeing people report um, on mental health, you know, across, you know, diverse. But are you finding that folks um, prefer the more kind of traditional psychological surveys or are you also looking at some biometrics that Britain had mentioned as well? Yeah, we haven't gotten into biometrics yet, but I totally agree that the physiological component, again, kind of what I started out by saying that stress seems to be a major factor. So Britain's kind of physiological aspects tells us, man, my system just kicked into high gear. And when it's happening all the time, that's when it's a problem, right? Um, but I do, I think the point of diversity and culture and ethnicity really matters to mental health because people don't necessarily 
respond the same way to clinical measures because of their ethnic background and the acceptability of mental health in their particular cultural background. So um, at Happify, for instance, the, the app that's generally available to people, we have a destigmatized version of asking about mental health. What we kind of give to the general population is something that's very approachable and doesn't feel like we're asking the PHQ2 and the GAD2 like you would at your physician, where you're prepared to be very very clinical, right? Like I go into my physician, I know I'm talking to a doctor, I'm ready to kind of get really clinical. When I'm doing something at home or I'm talking with my friends, maybe I'm more sensitive to not being clear about kind of talking about my my mental health in a very clinical way or with my employer or, you know, other people where I might be worried about the stigma. So I think there is a lot of ways that we need to think about um, how we ask it via self-report And how we kind of add to the self-report with other things like what Britain's getting and what we're learning from digital tools that can assess things like depression from your voice and other kind of metrics, because we're not great judges of how we are either, right? Like I, I, Rob can probably tell if I'm depressed before I'm depressed sometimes, so. Thank you, that's a a really good point. And I think it really, I think it carries a conversation, you know, in a direction where, I think we've highlighted, you know, mental health and well-being serving almost like as a predictor and now a moderator. And I think Eliana and Britain, I think Rob, to a certain extent, what you've also mentioned is, and 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 I'll chime in and answer Jared as well too, um, is so when folks learn that they have poor heart health or they have heart disease, what kind of toll does that have? Um, on them. Uh, And and the one thing I can say in my own work, you know, is I have looked a lot at mental health, you know, as a consequence. And, um, and in many ways, you know, there's several evidence that shows that, you know, um, depression and anxiety, PTSD, um, these can develop after cardiac events, um, such as, you know, um, stroke or heart failure or, or a heart attack. And I know you know, my own self being part of the cardiac rehab advisory board, um, that these are some of the areas that, you know, we're actually looking at because it's not necessarily treating mental health as primary, but treating mental health as secondary. But for those of us who are in the business of trying to optimize adherence to treatments and lifestyle management recommendations that we kind of have to treat mental health and well-being as secondary in many ways, um, because some of these disorders um, can be brought about after like this, uh, an acute heart disease or even if it's a chronic disease um, by way of pain. Um, folks who may go through open heart surgery, um, and this is a bit of a personal thing because I have two family members who have had open heart surgery and the mental health toll and emotional toll that it has on them um, is just really palpable. Um, oftentimes, and the literature bears this out as well, that after someone gets diagnosed with a heart disease or heart condition, or if they've had it for a long time, that there's this um, sense of fear of death and disability, which significantly impacts their quality of life. It impacts um, and increases social isolation where, and I think this is where some solutions, and we'll talk about that later, where being connected to groups of individuals who may be going through the same lived experience might be good in managing um, mental health through social support. Um, I've also seen in the literature too, and in our own work at University of Miami, previously at NYU School of Medicine, that people experience survival guilt um, after they've gone through a stroke or they've recovered or a heart attack and they have recovered. Um, and it's this sense of existential brooding for them. Um, and and it, you'll see it manifested in the form of an anxiety or they get extremely anxious or depressed. They may even have traumatic reactions either in the acute, which is usually within the first few weeks or the first month of that event, or it may be long-term, which would potentially develop into longer post-traumatic stress reactions. And last, but not least, and we must underscore this, 
um, is the impact, the financial and economic impact that treatment has and just chronic disease in general have on patients, whereby um, the sense that the stress that comes with pain, medical bills, which can be exorbitant over a period of time, um, it can take a significant emotional um, 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 well um, toll on individuals. Uh, so, so I think just want, it, I think it's important for us as clinicians, researchers, practitioners, whomever, um, to fully recognize and understand the fact that, that mental health and emotional well-being can serve as a consequence. It could be a derivative of that. And so we have to be mindful of that and put these, our patients and these individuals um, in, in these um, um, opportunities to get the necessary support. So I know, Rob, I know you've in some ways you know, thought this through um, in many ways, but uh, I'll, I'll perhaps go to Jared first, actually, um, or resident clinician. Um, Jared, how are you seeing this manifest in your own clinic, um, um, Jared, in terms of, you know, you know, dealing with the mental health consequences? I think you just named and your message right now. I think what you just communicated was really um, how interrelated mental health is with cardiovascular health and also how mental health can be, uh, child mental health challenges can be unmasked, they can be exacerbated, they can be catalyzed by health crises. So speaking to, with patients who have experienced sudden cardiac death um, and, and survived, that's a great outcome for them, but they have a long-term burden now of uh, putting back the pieces and there's fear, hesitation, anxieties, uncertainties that come with that. Um, I've sent many of my patients um, to have defibrillators implanted because clinically they've, they've merited that therapy. Um, and with that has to come a conversation about what, is it, what will you experience, what will you feel when you have a defibrillator inside your body? And you don't know if it might discharge, that might be life-saving, but there might be some morbidity and some mental morbidity that accompanies that. Even a modest outcome, like you said, like a coronary event, a myocardial infarction changes people's perception of themselves. They go from being healthy to unhealthy. And then something else that you mentioned that I think is so critical here is the financial toxicity. Harlan Krumholtz gave a great talk yesterday morning on financial toxicity and how so many of our patients, they're struggling so much. They have food insecurity, they have social challenges, they have the real complex array of social risk in our contemporary society, which is so divisive. Add on top of that a diagnosis, multiple medications and financial strain. And of course, mental health has to be a concomitant burden, a concomitant challenge that they actually experience. And so um, it seems to me like we really need to push this front and center. We really need to look at things like social risk and mental health as being foremost concerns to address in implementation of our guideline-based practice. Otherwise, we're really ignoring fundamental realities of patient experience in the contemporary world. I think you're, up here. I think you're spot on, Jared, and thank you for that. And, and I'm going to you know, hold on to the one word, concomitance, because I think you know, that really tees us up for, I think, the, the, the other way in which we've all kind of conceptualized this, you know, stitching or interconnection between mental health and CVD, which is, if it's not a risk factor, if it's not a moderate, if it's not a consequence, in some ways, we're hard to place where it belongs. And, and, and I think, you know, I think our group in many ways, you know, kind of described it as, it's a correlate or maybe it's an artifact, it's just there. Uh, and what do we do with that? Because with the previous descriptions, we could treat it primarily or we could treat it secondarily. Um, but, but what if it hasn't reached to the threshold of pathology um, or it has served in a dis as a disabling type of force, um, but it's there, uh, it has this insidious effect I don't know if, you know, Britton or Jared, if you could talk about that in terms of what you've seen in your own work, um, kind of describing mental health, emotional well-being as an artifact or a correlate to heart disease. 
I mean, it's certainly there, right? Like we all know, everyone on this panel knows that people with heart disease and heightened cardiovascular risk um, are at a much greater risk of poorer mental health. So for some of those people, it probably is an artifact, right? Like I, I think the thing about mental health is, is complicated and there is no, what we're getting at with this kind of first part of our panel is there's no one size fits all solution. For some people, it's the predictor. For some people, it's a consequence. And for some people, that consequence then leads to poor outcomes like Rob was talking about. Um, it might be an artifact of someone who already has a heart condition, but Britain's research is showing they're doom scrolling on social media and everything that's happening. They're getting poor mental health and it's not a consequence of their cardiovascular health, but it's also there and it's posing problems. So I, I think we're learning that it's it's all of the above, right? Thank you. Anyone would like to chime in, Jared? Sure, and, and I think that one other evaluation or one other piece of this complex puzzle here is the priority of mental health with regard to cardiovascular disease, because there are people who are so disabled by anxiety, for instance, or depression, that treating cardiovascular risk is, such a profound challenge and very difficult to add on to that. Um, I took care of many people in one clinic who had uh, chronic schizophrenia and uh, the smoking that's endemic in that population is so significant. Um, the idea of intervening to adjust that risk factor and correct cardiovascular health, uh, you know, I had, to hit, I had to learn through failure that that was not gonna be happening. Um, in more common diseases like depression and again, severe anxiety, the notion of chronic disease self-management, the challenges are really here, they're immense. And so it argues for, um, I think, not just clinician preparation, like we said, but also that we work with mental health workers long-term, hand in glove, in order to develop personalized effective solutions. Thanks, Jared. I think that's a really nice segue to talk about solutions because I'm sure folks are saying, okay, sure, yes, we, we're convinced that, yes, there is this relationship between the two. What do I do with this? I wasn't trained to do this. Neither do I have the resources to do this. And, and I think, you know, it, not that this particular panel, you know, it will offer panaceas per se. But let me start off with, with Rob here. Rob, if you could just kind of talk a little bit about the importance and benefits um, of targeting mental and physical health together um, rather than separately. Um, if you could just share a little bit about that, because I think oftentimes people feel that they're, you know, if they're not trained in it, then there is some level of boundary work, a phrase that Kurt Danzinger speaks about where I stay in my lane, you stay in yours, um, and there isn't much interdisciplinary exchange per se. What would you tell folks about that, Rob? Absolutely. I mean, first acknowledging that that is the case, right? There are many effective interventions for mental health, including treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and a whole host of digital options as well. Uh, there are also a vast number of cardiovascular health interventions, everything from simple step counters all the way up to comprehensive inpatient cardiac rehab programs. Um, but as you said, they're rarely combined. And I think some of that is perfectly natural. It's a hesitation to feel like, well, this isn't my domain of expertise. What if I mess it up? Um, and there are certain cases, right? You wouldn't want to have a licensed clinical psychologist with no cardiac training doing open heart surgery. Like when you look at it like that, of course it's absurd, uh, but also vice versa, a cardiologist who's never received training in cognitive behavioral therapy is unlikely to be comfortable uh, even stepping a toe into the water of the mental health zone. Um, and I think that leaves the door open for a sort of combined synthesis interventions that sort of already comprehensively address both factors and ideally in a personalized way. Um, we talked about this vicious cycle, right? Where because we have this bi-directional relationship, you have maybe the impulse is, well, the cardiovascular health issues are more exacerbated. Let's start with those. But there's enough lingering mental health issues on the side that interfere with that. So you really can't get much traction there. And that can happen vice versa. 
there's severe anxiety, uh, but because of the maybe chronic health burden someone's dealing with, they aren't even able to think clearly enough to start to try and apply whatever skills they're learning in their cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so if you could break that vicious cycle, if, if you could sort of surgically strike and try to, to, to find essentially the weak point in this linked phalanx of, of issues, uh, an intervention that was able to be adaptable and personalized and maybe even shift between acknowledging the fact that these are reinforcing each other uh, that could emphasize mental health and maybe this, the smallest bite-sized foot in the door way to begin to claw back some quality of life or some peace of mind that would allow you then to start to make the behavioral changes that you're hoping to make. Um, I think the fact that we could start to reduce psychological distress allows us to make some of those heart health behavior changes and the health behavior changes in turn might just reduce the physiological stress that you're experiencing. So if you can turn this on its head, there's a virtuous cycle that I think can begin in the other direction uh, and doing so using a combined intervention, one that is flexibly able to A, acknowledge the interdependencies and then B, apply whatever the sort of lowest hanging fruit is for that particular person to make the next step in their larger health journey, uh, I think is the key. This is sort of acknowledged by the AHA in January, they published their um, scientific statements on psychological health, well-being, and the mind-heart-body connection. It's all of these things all at once. And so why not go for it all? Why not have an intervention that tries to address these things comprehensively? So, so, so Rob, I love that. I, I want to pay a little bit of Angel's Advocate today is Sunday, so I'm going to play a little bit of Angel's Advocate. So I think that sounds great. So I am a clinician um, in an underserved, you know, FQHC. Um, I don't have the staff in to put together a comprehensive program. Um, Elian, share with us a little how potentially a, a digital solution would allow for that, allow for this more comprehensive, um, you know, in addressing mental and physical health, please. Because I, I know you all have done some really excellent work in that space and Britain as well, I'm sure. Um, if you could just share a little bit in terms of how can we kind of not necessarily boil the ocean, but tackle these two things at the same time. Right, I think, you know, beyond the obvious benefits of a digital solution in terms of reducing the barriers that people have to overcome to actually go get care, whether it's, uh, physical cardiovascular care or mental health care. And then when you've got both, you've now got two appointments you have to make and sit on the phone and make the appointment and wait in the office and all those kinds of things. Um, so beyond those obvious benefits of kind of being more scalable, reduced, more accessible, I think the other thing that I've been kind of realizing as I've been hearing everyone talk is one of the amazing benefits of kind of a digital personalized program is that I can bring in the Jareds and the Azizis to come and program that part of it. And then I can bring in the mental health experts. So I don't need a physician to be both. I don't need to refer my patient to someone else to now go see someone. So if I go see my PCP, she tells me, oh, you're scoring high in depression. Let me make you an appointment or let me send a referral. And we can really bring in the expertise from all sides to create a program that is like what Rob is saying, something that is personalized, that considers both aspects. And then with the beauty of things like AI and predictive kind of modeling, right, we can then have it be flexible, right? But then the other really cool thing that I think we sometimes are forget, but I think we're starting to realize is digital solutions can gather so much data. Right. So now the same digital solution that has all these other benefits can gather your steps. And with Apple Watch, it's an Apple Watch that does like an EKG or something. Right. Like all these things that as technology improves, a program can start to gather all of this. And in an ideal world, send it back to Jared so that because I don't think digital programs are going to solve needing to see a cardiologist, right? Like we probably all think that 
if someone told you, Jared, if someone came in and said, don't worry, Dr. Magnani, I don't need to come and see you next time. I'm going to check in on my phone, right? Like no one, I don't think we're, we're there for a long time. But the next time they see you, you could pull up a profile that shows you all this data about your patient that you wouldn't have otherwise, or like Britton was saying, would now be retrospective and subjective. They'd have to remember, we all know that's really flawed. So the idea that we can leverage technology to create these combined programs, but also leverage technology to make in-person care when it's needed better and more informative is one of the beauties of what's happening in the digital realm right now. I, I love that. And, and, and I'm going to push a little further because, you know, again, you know, we don't want this to be a panel where we're saying um, anything digital or personalized um, will cure the ills of our healthcare system. And I'll reach out to, to Jared No, because um, as I said, you know, digital solutions or interventions, and I think what Elian mentioned is absolutely on point, but they don't necessarily, or especially the consumer grade digital solutions and apparatus weren't necessarily built to be fully integrated into our healthcare system. So, so, so Jared, if you could just kind of talk briefly about one, um, the, the kind of the, the health systems approaches that you have built where you are and how have you integrated some of these digital um, solutions that Elian and Rob and Britton have all kind of developed and engineered, please? Well, one component of this that I think is uh, quite attention um, is the potential for inundation of data. If you have patients who can check their heart rhythm and their heart rates, for instance, or provide a step count on a daily basis, maybe even an hourly basis, perhaps concomitant with symptoms, then that has to be reviewed because potentially that's clinically actionable. And so you've added a layer of stress that people have to supervise and they have to fund. And wow, is that an enormous amount of work. So that's one hesitation with digital solutions. In my program, what we do is we give smartphones to people who are rural or else they're what we would call underserved and they don't have smartphones. And we devote an enormous amount of time in teaching them how to use their smartphones so that they can use a virtual agent and have exchanges to get disease education for chronic heart disease, as well as learn how to monitor their symptoms and then work on strategies towards medication adherence, which is the principal goal of our program. And so um, we do not have an interface with our healthcare system and we screen the potentially actionable data and we selectively feed that back to clinicians. Um, and then we also document that too. So that's a layer that has to be built in um, from the ground level. And to make that scalable, I think requires huge investment, enormous attention, a whole lot of resources. I think these are some fundamental challenges. The other thing is that the people who have the greatest social risk because they have the least resources are those for whom many of these technologies um, still, there still is a digital divide in this country, obviously. Uh, and I think that that also has to be addressed too. Um, in order to make these solutions generalizable, we have to seek out people who would benefit the most. And those are people who um, will definitely have the greatest social risk factors, the least access to Wi-Fi perhaps, or just even basic um, digital literacy as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jared. I mean, that sounds like excellent work. And, and I love how you, know, you have really stitched together your program in a seamless way. Um, because I think what you highlight and I've followed you know, your work um, is the fact that we, we can't take it for granted that the digital literacy, forget access, but digital literacy as well. Because one of the things that I want to demystify this myth that you know, we cannot provide underserved communities with the best of our solutions. I, I, I think that is, I think for me, the sin qua non of my own work, where I feel that some of our best solutions um, must go to the most underserved. 
I, and here is why, and I'll bring in Britain here because I, I think Britain's work is just absolutely great because while Jared's um, work, you know, has a very kind of precision laser focus on a particular community and kind of bootstrapping that community to help them better um, leverage the resources of the health system. I think there are so many folks who don't have access to the wonderful health system that um, Jared and I work in, and especially the platform that, uh, um, that you all have built. So therefore we must use novel types of social communities, digital communities to convey um, you know, better heart health and a connection with mental health. And I know Brittany, you and Shuffle Me, you've done some great work in that space. Can you share a little bit more for us in terms of how do you then engage folks in know, social media or, or other spaces just to raise literacy, health literacy about this connection um, um, because folks may never come to us at the clinic level. Right, what we try to do is we try to target those who are already on social media, right? You have your youth and you have your young adults and they love scrolling, they love content, right? And what we then try to do afterwards is we provide that data back to them. Um, you know, we show them, okay, hey, this is the content that impacted your mood. We have a positive section, we have a, a negative positive section, uh, I'm sorry, a negative section. So we have two different trending sections. And then we also list out, okay, well, this is when your heart rate dropped. And this is, this is what that uh, BPM was. So we try to give as much data that they give us back. And that way they can share that with their therapist, their counselor, their friends, their family. And that also creates an opportunity to have that discussion, right? Open communication, removing the stigma that I can't talk about how I'm feeling right now. But now you can just kind of send that data over and then that, that opens that conversation. So again, it's kind of, you know, again, like you mentioned, you know, they may, they might can't go to Dr. Rodina, you know, they might can't go um, and, and get those services but they now have this data, they can at least share it. Um, and we can at least show them that, you know, this is, this is what's happening to your autonomic nervous system when you're just simply online, trying to have those communities, trying to find people who may be, you know, as happy as you or as depressed as you or trying to find some kind of community so you can have some sort of belonging. Because a lot of, you know, youth and young adults are on social media. That's just how, People go dating now online, right? Do you really go outside to find someone, you know, to mingle with? No, you go online. Um, so since everything is digitally, that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to capture as much data as possible and then providing it back to the end user so they can see, okay, this is really what's happening. And we're taking that data and giving it back to increase their, their understanding of, you know, self-awareness and just emotional intelligence altogether. I think that's really cool, Brittany. I and, I, and I'll just kind of throw this out because I have some of my own thoughts because I think, you know, we, we, we kind of went on, you know, a thought process where we're saying, yeah, digital. And we spoke about what are some of the barriers. Um, but it seemed as if there was a kernel of, of consensus and truth where um, that the, the data must be instructive. Um, and, and it has to do with kind of feeding back um, the, the, the data and, and it depends to who. So, so I think I'll just love to get your thoughts because, you know, even in, in my own work, you know, um, you know my, my framework, precision and personalized population health, you know, we, we believe that um, we need to keep all, you know, members of the healthcare, uh, all stakeholders of the healthcare ecosystem engaged. And, and so this is why we believe that one, um, you know, interventions must be precise, must be personalized, but must also apply to the population. And, you know, and so I'm just curious, um, you know, for you all, you know, the issue of addressing mental health, CVD, across or at the population level, what are your thoughts? Um, because I know we said we need to reach out to underserved communities and typically that's good, but that's really just group based interventions. Um, I, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are as to what are the right ingredients needed um, to develop such a population health framework in addressing this relationship. And, and, and this is a free for anyone can chime in. 
Well, I think in brief, um, this panel sort of makes me feel like I live in an upside down world. Um, you know, the religion that we cardiologists practice, the hammer that we have in our pocket is to address that high cholesterol level. And um, we don't ask our patients um, what grade in school they completed. We don't find out how much they can read. We don't ask about their social resources, um, all of these factors and add on to that mental health as well. And so what I think we really need to do is um, to take mental health out of the step sibling in the back seat and focus foremost on how we can find opportunities in acute care and chronic care um, to really maximally assess and intervene. I think that's a, a take home for us from this session. Um, and I think that what we have now is we have Epic and other, other tools in which we can document and store this information. And, you know, we, we talk a big game about putting social determinants in the medical health record. Um, mental health also merits a flag as well. So let's make that a, um, a, a, a uniform guidepost, if you will. Maybe this should be um, advanced in terms of um, uh, the way that we practice in terms of our guidelines. Perhaps it, it seems to me to be um, really important and critical when it's overlooked. I love that. Anyone else would like to chime in? I see that we have quite a few comments and questions coming in, which I'm sure you all will be eager um, to answer. And I'm sure our audience is eager to hear your thoughts. I just add on to what Jared said, which I think is really great that the idea that mental health needs to be taken out of the backseat now become kind of part of the, the major conversation. And I go a step further and say that we need to start thinking about mental health in the same way that we think about physical health. We encourage people to go get a well visit every year. We don't encourage people to do that with mental health. Um, and in other places, your mental health is not covered in the same way by your insurance as um, your physical health is. In lots of places, you have to pay out of pocket to see someone for your mental health, right? So if we really are acknowledging that mental health is such a important factor to physical health, whether it's cardiovascular conditions or other chronic health conditions, we really need to start saying we need to treat it the same way as physical health. We don't wait until there's a problem. We treat it preventatively in the same way. And we encourage people to kind of take care of themselves mentally, just as we take care of ourselves physically. And I think until we reach that point, we're always going to be playing catch up of how do we treat these two? We really need to kind of bring them together on a broad level rather than just kind of the conversation we're having today. I agree. I think it's absolutely critical you know, um, cementing mental health, um, you know, to be an on par. And I even hate to establish any kind of, you know, kind of Cartesian dichotomy between the two, but it needs to be across the entire continuum of care from discovery of etiology of disease, all the way to the translation to treatments and solutions. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn to questions because I'm seeing some fantastic questions. Um, first, um, and I'll just read the question. So feel free, anyone who would like to, to, to jump in. Um, <clears throat> question is this, do you have any comments or data about the effectiveness of using biofeedback as treatment for anxiety or other mental health disorders? Anyone would like to chime in here about biofeedback? I can speak a little to that. I'm certainly not an expert in this area, uh, but I my understanding is that this is a fairly promising, but still young field. Um, one prominent example that comes to mind uh, is a digital therapeutic called Freespira, uh, which uses a biofeedback mechanism to help uh, control panic disorder by essentially regulating how much CO2 is uh, being received by someone who is like learning how to breathe in, in a slower, more oxygen rich way, which is fascinating and amazing technology. Um, and so that I think has shown uh, some some strong effectiveness uh, and is, is one of the few FDA cleared prescription digital therapeutics uh, currently available in the United States. Um, so that's one example. I'm also vaguely aware that uh, there are some mindfulness based biofeedback devices um, that are ranging from what sound a little bit sci science fiction-y, right? You might have a, a sort of EKG uh, type apparatus that is 
attempting to monitor the uh, electrical activity of your brain and give you a little feedback about when have I dampened the default node network, for instance. Um, I don't know how precise or effective those are yet, but I think there's a lot of interest in that research and that it's very possible uh, that that could be extremely promising um, in the future. I'll jump in too and say that um, biofeedback seems to be promising for heart rate variability. So in fact, we have um, an activity on our Hapify platform that allows you to put your finger on your camera and then kind of tells you when to breathe and when to exhale. And as you kind of start to do that very well and regulate your breathing and regulate your heart rate, which it can kind of tell by your, your little finger on your camera, um, it actually shows you a nicer um, scene that you're witnessing. So you can tell when you're doing well, and we've shown evidence empirically um, that it can help reduce um, alpha amylase after a stressful event. So I think there's the biofeedback is probably not going to be a cure-all for everything, but particularly when it comes to kind of stress-based, anxiety-based things, the biofeedback seems to be really promising. I, I love how, what you just said, because I think what, you know, what we don't want is you know, we don't want this to be the newest craze on fat. And, and, and I'm not saying that about the person who brought this up, but what we need to do, and especially I think you can hear that the majority of us, or perhaps most of us on this panel, we believe that, you know, interventions must be tailored. They must be precise um, and very surgical. And so the issue of biofeedback based on some of the work that I've done in either virtual reality or haptic reality is the fact that, you must determine for whom this will work, at what time, right? Um, and in what situations. Um, and to recognize that it may only work in acute situations. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use it acutely over an extended period of time, but it certainly really allows us to raise the issue up. We must be able to determine, and, and I agree, there needs to be more evidence about um, for whom, when, and what situation, and for the, the, the dosage and period that would work. So really excellent. Um, some more questions are coming in. And, and, and we have a bit of a treat, um, a bit of a doozy treat too, because many of you may think that we were gonna just be all academics and talk about the relationship and then provide solutions. We actually have a demo, which will come up in a couple of minutes, um, showing you how you can utilize um, 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 a kind of an integrated digital solution, assessing mental health, as well as providing solutions. I'll go to a few more questions, and I, I love this one. Um, would you please provide with specific examples, because I, I, I think if the person could underline, I think that's what they want, specific examples, how you go over barriers of digital literacy in underserved populations. It's a general question, not specific to mental health, but since I think digital solutions seems to be the running theme throughout, anyone could share how you have addressed digital literacy in underserved communities. And I wouldn't just say underserved communities, um, but all um, communities as well, because I, we don't want to say that um, only underserved communities have issues with dig, um, um, digital literacy. Anyone can uh, um, chime in, please. So I think I can start by taking this one. Um, so in our program, what we do is we have uh, an intervention, which is um, a four month um, interface that people have with a smartphone. And uh, it's a virtual agent that provides them with guidance. And um, I won't go into the details about what the content actually is, but we devote an enormous amount of time to training people um, how to use their smartphone. And so we developed a guide that is a step-by-step -step guide um, that's tailored for people who have a sixth grade reading level. Um, it's gone through an assessment and um, it provides them with um, a lot of um, very easy graphics. And then when we call them on the phone after they've received their phone, we're able to go through this in kind of a step-by-step -step fashion. And that way we're able to see that they understand how to use the phone. And these are rural people. They're very socially isolated. If you leave Pittsburgh and go 10 miles in any direction, then you're really in, you know, in the deep red zone, you know, and um, these are adults who have chronic heart disease and they're, they're older, they're in their seventies. 
So they experience an enormous amount of social isolation and they have to make decisions about whether or not they drive 30 miles to see their doctor. And so this is a vehicle we think for obviously helping them with their chronic disease self-management. Um, but it's, it requires a lot of attention from my team. And I think that that's kind of um, the, the answer to uh, Dr. Hamash's question here, you know, is, is that you, you really have to, you really have to roll up your sleeves and you have to make this very integral to your program. You cannot take it for granted. And so um, what I'm saying is that um, the, the recipe is very detailed step-by-step -step instructions. Then there's a follow-up call seven days later to verify, did you get it? And what are the problems you're having um, to try to make sure that there's retention and also to reinforce the instruction. Thanks. I, I'll just share this, and, and I'm not doing a shameless plug, but you know, we published a paper in JMIR um, speaking about the pan-theoretical approach and framework we've created. And in that, you know, we raised a scenario where um, not just digital literacy per se, um, but what if the person um, is not comfortable or savvy um, with technology? Um, which is a subset of the larger construct of digital literacy. And we outline a step program, how you actually, you know, in a similar way to Jared, but different in the sense that how we prepare someone, especially for older adults in the work that I do in terms of, you know, brain health as well as heart disease. Um, and and what we've done is we have created a community steering committee in all of our programs. And a community steering committee are members of the community who help to set the agenda, one of the research study, if you're using the digital solution for research purposes, if it's for clinical purposes, they come in and speak with the entire treatment team. They become part of the solution shots and they are part integral in the development of it. Um, in the wireframes that I create, um, we have partners and people in the community. So it's not necessarily because oftentimes when we talk about digital literacy, we treat it as if it is a intellectual quotient. And if you check it, most people don't necessarily know how to operate device, especially the types of devices that we use in our work. So what that means therefore is that you must specifically one, bring them initially into the development of the solution, as well as do cognitive testing um, cognitive load testing, um, ensuring that the wireframes are engaging, as well as having and doing some of the things that Jared mentioned. How to create a username and a password, right? Um, how to turn things on, when to. And we provide notifications and nudges how to do that. And we peer it down at not just the reading level, but at least a comfort level so that people have a certain degree of mastery. So um, with that, Anyone else would like to chime in? Because I know Rob, um, he would love to show the fantastic demo because um, we want people to walk away, blown away um, with how is it that you can utilize a digital solution to assess and treat mental health comorbid with uh, a heart disease. Any other, anyone else would like to chime in? All right, if not, Rob, take it away, please, with this demo. So this has been a fascinating, invigorating discussion about the intersections between mental health and cardiovascular health. Uh, as Azizi said, now we'd like to take the opportunity to explore a concrete example of how these ideas can be leveraged to inform the creation of a real digital intervention that accounts for both. As we noted, uh, there are perhaps no two larger challenges to our collective well being than cardiovascular disease, the leading killer of adults in the developed world, and mental health issues, one of the leading causes of disability. Both the American Heart Association and Happify Health recognize the importance of mental health for both physical health and chronic illness. Happify Health has been focused on this link for some time, actually, in multiple different chronic condition areas, uh, such as diabetes and multiple sclerosis. Uh, and in 2019, the AHA's 40-member-plus 
CEO Roundtable commissioned and published a report on mental health in the workplace, which produced a roadmap for employers to tackle growing challenges for addressing mental health issues. Uh, they also published their scientific statements earlier this year on the intersection, the heart-mind-body connection. So this shared recognition led to a natural partnership between the AHA's Center for Health Tech and Innovation and Happify Health that was centered around the importance of mental health in addressing cardiovascular disease. So as we discussed today, these are not two independent issues. Uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that mental health and cardiovascular health are closely and complexly intertwined. Um, but of particular importance here are the studies that show that improvements in mental health may lead to downstream positive effects, like improved self-care and better ability to adopt and maintain health behaviors that are critical to overall physical and cardiovascular health. Uh, but despite these findings, mental health and cardiovascular health often remain siloed for many of the sort of systemic reasons we discussed earlier. And when they're addressed separately, these different approaches can't synthesize and take advantages of the overlaps between the two. So Happify and the AHA recognized this need for a unified approach and created a mental health intervention that was specifically tailored to support healthy behavior change for populations with cardiovascular disease risks. And this intervention was Happify Heart and Mind. With our established track record in mental health, Happify worked with the cardiovascular expert, experts from AHA to create Happify Heart and Mind, which is a program designed to improve mental health and encourage heart healthy behavior in individuals with cardiovascular disease risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, et cetera. So Happify Heart and Mind is tailored to help patients address AHA's Life Simple 7. And these are the seven risk factors that people can improve through lifestyle changes to achieve ideal cardiovascular health. And Heart and Mind does this by teaching people skills to manage their mental health and their health behaviors, allowing them to create sustainable behavior change and develop healthy habits around diet, activity, exercise, and sleep. Now, before we dive into the details of the Heart and Mind program, let's just take a quick look at how the Happify platform itself works. So Happify is a digital intervention designed to support mental and physical health through engagement with a variety of gamified activities drawn from evidence-based therapeutic modalities, including cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral activation, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and positive psychology, among many others. Activities are grouped into six different skills. Uh, these are savoring, thanking, aspiring, giving, empathizing, and reviving. And we put these together into cohesive four-part programs that we call tracks that are meant to focus the user on improving a specific area of concern. The Happify platform has been shown through numerous studies, including randomized controlled trials to improve symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress, as well as well-being and resilience. Um, taking that more comprehensive look at mental health as opposed to just focusing on the negative aspects. Here's just a very brief summary of results from our 2018 RCT, which just showed significant improvements in depression, anxiety, and resilience over eight weeks for Happify users compared to a psychoeducation control. Most relevant to our discussion today is our recently accepted publication in JMIR Cardio, uh, which showed that real-world Happify users with cardiovascular disease risks experienced significant improvements in their mental health, including both their subjective well-being and their anxiety levels, and that these improvements were actually greater for those who used Happify more than those who used less. So now that we have a sense of how Happify works, let's dive into a few of the specifics of the Heart and Mind program itself. So Happify Heart and Mind is organized into 10 tracks, including one track created exclusively for the program by the AHA, which we'll take a closer look at in just a moment. Uh, all these tracks that are included in this program have also been enhanced with additional activities. So they come from the sort of traditional mental health Happify intervention, but were infused with some AHA specific activities like goal setting exercises, strategies for incorporating more heart healthy foods and diets, healthy meal prep, and ways to integrate uh, more movement into their day, including videos that feature stretching or core exercises, resistance training, or yoga. 
So here's a look at one of the key tracks. This is called Defeat Stress and Live a Heart Healthy Life, co-created with AHA's own Dr. Patrick Dunn, who is behind the scenes here uh, helping us out. To incorporate the AHA's excellent and informative content around Life Simple 7, uh, we brought in the experts to actually provide that themselves. So this track emphasizes stress management as well as healthier eating and increasing movement to support heart health. Happify's behavior change model is based on evidence that bite-sized interventions that easily fit into a user's schedule actually add up to a meaningful impact. So each day the platform unlocks different fun and fast exercises that over time will grow and in complexity as you work through the program, training the brain to form healthier habits when it comes to things like expressing gratitude and overcoming negativity. So each of these activities also reflects one of those six essential life skills that I mentioned earlier that help make Capify feel accessible and achievable as part of everyday life, right? That ties to the stigma idea that we talked about earlier. If mental health is always focused on the negative about the suffering, uh, it's harder to get people to engage with and want to move towards and actually actively enjoy working on a program like that. So once the individual has completed an activity, they receive a medal, uh, which is tracked in their My Stats section, which lets them know how they're doing and building up these essential skills. Uh, these allow for positive reinforcements. Uh, this takes advantage of some of the aspects of gamification that have come under scrutiny in some cases, in, in the case of social media, um, that we believe in the right context can actually be helpful in encouraging people to use activities and interventions that are in fact beneficial for them as opposed to those that take their time away from things that are most important. Uh, Happify Heart and Mind also incorporates regular assessments, like we talked about earlier, which can help give users uh, and their providers insight into their progress, as well as opportunities for growth. These assessments include the Happify scale, uh, a proprietary validated measure of subjective well-being developed by our chief science officer, Dr. Acacia Parks. Every two weeks, users are invited to complete a happiness assessment, which includes both the happiness scale and the GAD2, the validated measure of anxiety that we mentioned earlier. So the Happify scale, which focuses on well-being, is also highly correlated with the PHQ-9, uh, that commonly used measure of depression. And this allows users to track their well-being in a quick, easy, stigma-free way, while also allowing Happify and providers to gain insight into their current level of depressive symptoms without having to directly go after them. And then finally, every two weeks, users are, uh, oh, excuse me, we've also added, in addition to the Happify assessments, uh, a assessment that covers AHA's Life Simple 7, right? We want to track the things that the program is focused on. Uh, and this includes a variety of items that helps users specifically track and improve their cardiovascular health progress. Uh, very quick, brief overview, uh, but thank you so much. We hope that this at least provided some insight into how this powerful relationship between mental health and cardiovascular health can be concretely leveraged in the form of a digital intervention to help support people in making and maintaining sustainable behavior change in pursuit of longer, healthier, and happier lives. Thank you, Rob. Amazing. Really exciting to see what the AHA um, and Happify have put together. And I'm sure there are so many other similar types of initiatives doing ingenious work. I think we have perhaps 30 seconds for any questions for Rob, please feel free um, to type it in the chat so that um, I will relay your question. I think you you wowed them so much. They ask, <laughs> is, this, is this on the app store? Uh, currently the Heart and Mind program is available uh, through enterprise programs. So there are uh, health providers and employers who uh, would have to purchase this as part of their programs to offer to the folks that they cover. Perfect. So 
Well, we can mention that. Coming. Yes. Sorry, we can sorry just mention <laughs> if um, Patricia is interested. The regular Happify platform, which does um, show to improve mental well being and reduce anxiety for people with cardiovascular risk, is available on the App Store. And there's a free version as well as a premium monthly version. Um, and I'm happy to drop my email in the chat if anyone was interested in having a further conversation. We are not salespeople, we are researchers, <laughs> but we're happy to direct people to. To, um, the right folks if they are interested. Sure, and, and, and not that this needs to be said, but this was not a, a sales pitch either um, for the panel. It, it really was to provide the audience a concrete example as what could be done within the digital landscape. So with that, I, I know it's time to wrap, but I would like to thank my esteemed um, panelists today, Elian, Rob, Britton, Jared. Um, and as well as um, the wonderful audience that we ha um, had today. Um, I hope everyone is having a wonderful scientific sessions. Um, wish we were there in person, um, but because we're digital folks and we're digital enthusiasts, I'm sure you can connect with us um, digitally or virtually. So it's my pleasure um, to serve as your moderator today, um, Aziz Isatius. Um, pleasure meeting you all and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Azizi. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.